All right. Hello, and welcome to today's Crane Shares webinar, a global luxury deep dive with CLSA's Chris Gow. My name is Brendan O'Hearn. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Crane Shares Exchange Traded Funds. Historically, Crane Shares China-focused exchange traded funds have focused on explicit exposure to China's uh, Chinese stocks within the growth segments of China's capital markets and economy. Late last year, we listed the Crane Shares Global Luxury Index ETF, ticker KLXY, which provides implicit exposure to Chinese consumption through European, Asian, and US luxury stocks. KLXY's 50 plus holdings might be difficult for some investors to gain access to due to these overseas listings. Today, I'm happy to host institutional research and brokerage firm, CLSA's Hong Kong-based luxury goods analyst, Chris Gao. I had the pleasure of first meeting Chris uh, in December of, of late last year uh, while visiting Hong Kong. Uh, my visit with Chris was mainly driven by this incredible, uh, I call it the Magna Carta of luxury goods investing, this very, very thorough um, overview of the luxury goods space that Chris, you wrote. It's just such an impressive deep dive into the space. And when we heard that you were coming here to New York, we said, Chris, you got to come in the office. You got to come and share this wealth of knowledge that is encompassed in this you know, incredible research piece you wrote. It's so impressive. Uh, welcome, first and foremost, welcome to New York, and we're so happy that you carved out some time to spend some time with us as well as our, our investors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thanks so much for Crane Shares for kindly inviting us. And of course, like our work, right? We did uh, have a long track record following luxury goods mm -hmm. separate in China. And me myself is also the first way to China analyst in China to cover this, you know. One hundred will knock on wood right then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Chris, during you know, we're gonna have a little bit of a Q and A right. following, uh, following your presentations. So just for those of us joining, if you're joining us on craneshares.com, uh, please proactively email us questions to info at craneshares.com. If you're joining us via Zoom. Uh, please use the Q&A button to ask any questions. Uh, for those, um, you know, please, again, the whole idea is to provide a thorough Q&A following mm -hmm. Chris's presentation. Now, I just want to spend a quick moment just on uh, Crane Shares for those of you who might not be as familiar with us, uh, that our founder, Jonathan Crane, originally formed two core beliefs during his experience living and building a successful business in China. Uh, those two initial beliefs were the basis for the founding of Crane Shares over 11 years ago. The first was that while new China sectors such as domestic consumption, internet, e-commerce, semiconductors, clean technology, and healthcare have become the new drivers of China's economic growth, those sectors are still under allocated in global portfolios. Uh, the second thesis Jonathan had was the opening of China's mainland equity markets, the second largest in the world, uh, to foreign investors would have a significant impact on global indices as well as investors' portfolios. Uh, so we wanted to gain access into those China mainland markets in advance of their index inclusions. But more importantly, we endeavor to earn the trust of investors through our balanced data-driven perspective on China's economies and cap uh, China's economy and capital markets, China's rise in market indices as well as the rise of its economy will necessitate investors have a partner to navigate developments as they occur. Crane Shares wants to earn that partnership role with you. We maintain a daily research blog that is available at www.chinalastnight.com, which we encourage you to subscribe to in order to keep abreast of new developments as they occur on a daily basis. So uh, one of the things that we did uh, late uh, in the fall of last year uh, was we took our 
our historical China suite of ETFs, uh, which again, are more focused on explicit exposure. And what I mean by that is actually owning Chinese stocks within say the internet sector or healthcare, 5G semiconductor. In this case, we wanted to provide an implicit China exposure, which was through the gl uh, global luxury space, uh, which has really been driven by Chinese consumers, both domestic as well as international travel purchases. Obviously, there's a host of other players within broader Asia, Europe, and the United States, uh, but even the global luxury companies themselves have really pivoted and focused on China. Um, and, and I thought one of the great things about Chris's piece uh, is its emphasis on China, that, yeah. that it's uh, certainly it's focused on what's happening with these companies and the broader sector. But uh, what I found really interesting is you talk about some of the things happening right. within China and the consumers that's impacting these non-Chinese listed companies. So do I want to hand things off to Chris uh, just to provide uh, some of those great insights that I've been alluding to. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. And again, thanks, Queen Share, for kindly having me here. And uh, this is Chris Gao, the European Luxury Goods Analyst and a China Consumer Analyst in Citix LSA. So maybe before I kick off, I'll first introduce who we are, and then we'll kick off with how the year of 20, 2023 concludes for luxury, and how we view the 2024, and how does Chinese clientele evolve, and finally, how the latest result season looks like. So maybe firstly, something about ourselves. Uh, CityCL SA is the best-in-class regional uh, broker headquartered in Hong Kong and established in the year of 1986. We have already covered 13 countries across the APEC region. So we actually provide global investors uh, with insights, liquidity, and the capital to drive their investment strategies. And um, CLSA is famous for its independent research as well as the strong Asian footprint and direct link to China. Since being acquired by Citic Securities in the year of 2013, which is uh, Citic Securities, the large Chinese investor mm -hmm. bank uh, in terms of gross asset, gross revenue, et cetera, uh, Citic actually strongly synergizes the business and making Citic CLSA uniquely positioned to the cross border capital flows to connect China with the world. And myself, as I um, introduced earlier a bit, I joined CIS in 2021 to cover consumer space, uh, some China-Hong Kong consumer discretionary, including apparel, durable goods, uh, cosmetics, retail, and also, of course, global luxury goods. So I have five years experience covering this sector as the first Chinese analyst in China to cover the sector, right? So maybe now uh, let's kick into the main part about how, how we view luxury and how it did in 2023. So next slide, please. Um, large in size, constantly outperformance. This is how we describe luxury. We hold a structural long-term positive view on personal luxury goods. And actually luxury, we believe, explains well on the concept of less is more. The most important competitive advantage of luxury goods versus mass consumer goods is the strong pricing power supported by the desirability, uh, uh, desirability backed uh, brand equity. So with a high entry barrier with timeless heritage narration, uh, scarcity of supply, and also with the consumer group with strongest spending power, uh, these advantages together translate into a superior pricing power. And um, this brings outstanding capital return of the luxury names. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, for the personal luxury goods sector, we actually saw a 5.5% CAGR over the past two decades. And this performance, long-term performance, significantly outgrows global GDP, which is somewhere around 3%, right? And um, during the pandemic, the luxury personal luxury goods growth uh, significantly accelerated. If you look at the uh, growth CAGR over the year 2019 to 2022, uh, the CAGR even reached around 7.5 CAGR. So this even outperformed the long-term average. This is thanks to the wealth effect, especially for American clientele, the reopening impact that boosted revenge spending and traveling globally, as well as the favorable uh, euro currency impact, which become a, a, a strong attraction for overseas tourists. And uh, heading into 2023, the global personal luxury goods market size reached around uh, 362 billion euro per billion out gamma 
and this grow at an 8% constant FX rate and 4% for current rate. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, the growth in the year of 2023, however, if you look at by quarter, also start to see some normalization starting from the second quarter of 2023. As we said, the sector has been significantly outgrowing itself's long-term average for some time already. Um, and also, even it is starting to see some normalization, the, uh, the growth uh, at the end of the year of the 4Q is still in a very healthy way. 4Q sees, you know, sequentially better and grow at more or less 4 percentage points in the effect, constant FX. And also, finally, uh, the, the year reached at around, you know, a still uh, strong end of 8% constant FX growth. So uh, next uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in the in the year of 2023, as Brandon also highlighted previously, and also we indicated in our, you know, 330 pages large report, <laughs> yeah, we call for a refocus on the Chinese spending recovery post reopening. And we also identify this as a structural midterm engine of the luxury goods growth. Uh, so Chinese spend uh, actually accounts for one third of the total personal luxury goods market pre-COVID. And uh, in the year of the reopening of 2023, uh, this clientele actually sees the worldwide growth of around 25 to 27% uh, constant FX growth as per band. So this actually exit our you know, previously expectation. And the Japanese is also very strong, um, uh, thanks to, you know, the also the recovering impact and also its, you know, economy has been seeing some rejuvenation and thanks to the uh, gradually inflowing inbound tourists and also the favorable uh, FX impact, making, you know, the, the local uh, spending also very good. And um, at the meantime, European and Americans saw a worldwide drop on a challenging base and also a complicated macro environment. So next slide, please. Okay, here is a, uh, another overview in terms of the growth by channel and by in, uh, and by category. As you can see that uh, the growth by, by channel in the year of 2023 sees a strong comeback of travel retail, of course, because the travel has been gradually recovering. Another you know, channel that has been seeing good performance is uh, as the model brand stores, of course, also thanks to the traffic. Uh, recovery as well as uh, the coming back Chinese clientele actually shows a higher average ticket size than before because right now the uh, the group of people who are able to come in back are with you know uh, still very strong price uh, strong spending power independent travelers rather than the group tours mm. so also another channel as uh, as showing resilience is of the off price stores right so the off price stores also penetrate into uh, aspirational customers who are actually uh, uh, enduring a relatively, you know, less uh, less better off period, but still uh, for those who are more price sensitive, off price stores may be a good place to go, right? In terms of the uh, worldwide growth by category, actually we see that the jewelry is outperforming, right? And also in terms of the uh, handbags as well as the uh, as well as the apparel names, these are also seeing resilient growth. So next slide, please. For the next section, we would like to dig a little bit more into uh, Chinese uh, Chinese customers, how their you know uh, consumer profile looks like, and how they changes over the past decade. So here is a very interesting comparison. You know, CISA used to have you know very strong heritage in terms of luxury goods before I joined too. Um, we have did a lot of you know. Uh, deep dive into Asian consumers uh, when we when we were the you know the uh, sponsor of uh, uh, Prada's IPO in Hong Kong, right? So that if you compare with the you know uh, consumer profile in the year of 2011 uh, versus 2023, actually you can see uh, firstly it was definitely more gender balanced. We see a stronger you know female power here, and secondly we can see the uh, the demographics becoming younger and younger if you compare with 2011 to 2012. Uh, 2021 and 2023, you can see the average age is declining, right? And thirdly, if you're looking at the, you know, the uh, favorite categories uh, for the watch purchase, actually, you can see uh, 2021, maybe a little bit less than 2011, uh, because of, you know, the end of corruptions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the 2023, the, you know, momentum is getting back uh, slightly. Mm. Uh, for cars, actually, maybe, you know, people are owning less cars in 2021 versus 2011. Well, in 2023, we don't have data here. 
So in terms of the house ownership, we don't have numbers in 2011. But if you compare with 2023 with 2021, you can see that for you know uh, each of the high net worth they own. Uh, one 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 house less uh in in the in the next two, two years time right this actually correlates with uh, what we saw in China's real estate right now right so uh these are actually you know um very interesting findings about people how people place their wealth into real estates into different categories and also lastly we see uh more spending towards the self use or self rewarded purchases than just a gifting based approach. This also explains that you know we can see a more diversified uh, category uh, being uh, being uh, you know injected into like you know jewelries uh, like hand hand uh, handbags uh, etc. Being very robust in the past and well for watch maybe during a relatively hard time. So uh, next slide please. As we said, China has been seeing rising younger generation of female power. You can see that uh, the uh, the uh, age between uh, be below 20, 25 years old actually accounts for more than half of the total consumers, uh, uh, even though their average ticket size may be lower, right? And average age of uh, China's new consumers is only eight, uh, 28 years old. And 90% 90 Chinese, uh, 90 Chinese luxury consumers are millennials in Generation Z. In terms of the you know uh, uh, gender breakdown, more female luxury consumers has been uh, rising over time, and you can see as a rule of thumb, the heavy spenders of China uh, of Chinese luxury uh, consumers, uh, which accounts for ten percent of the of the total, contributes to forty percent of the spending share. So next slide, please. And in terms of the luxury spending repatriation over time, we believe this statement is structural. And this repatriation is actually uh, um, more materialized uh, during the pandemic period, uh, when the cross-border traffic becoming, you know, uh, more restricted due to the uh, due to the health management, right? So in the near term, actually, we see a gradual recovery in outbound travel since border reopening, but we still expect, you know, the home purchase will be will account for the majority of Chinese clientele in the long term. Okay, so uh, some uh, some more elaboration into the you know outbound travel recovery uh, starting from twenty twenty three. Actually, you can see uh, the exit rate of the China's total outbound air passengers as a percentage of twenty nineteen has already reached seventy percent, which make the blended twenty twenty three average at forty to fifty percent of twenty nineteen level. So heading into 2024, you still have, you know, meaningful room of recovery in terms of outbound traffic, right? Uh, uh, and uh, from the other from the other side, we expect, you know, a lot of uh, work that has been done of the global luxury companies, uh, including the product supply, uh, including the CRM development in local market, in terms of the local localized product offerings, engagements, and the omni-channel efforts will actually make uh, local market uh, more of, uh, you know, uh, Chinese consumers' choice even after the reopening. Mm -hmm. And also the continuously lowering uh, price gap versus foreign markets will also help with the repatriation. So that's why we believe, you know, those repatriation to China home market is a structural trend, it's an inevitable trend. And we expect home market purchase to account for two thirds of the total Chinese demand in the mid to long term. So next slide, please. In this slide, you can see that uh, actually a lot of you know uh, work has been done uh, through luxury brands. They did uh, they did incorporate a lot of Chinese elements uh, in the brand event, which will trigger Generation Z interest uh, versus overall consumers. Right, uh, Gen uh, Gen Z are tend to be more interested in Chinese elements, and they also have you know uh, very uh, very high you know acceptance into the fashion show live streaming, which is also tailor made to China's social media. Yeah, right in Weibo, in Xiaohongshu, uh, etc. And also there are a lot of, you know, uh, collaborated uh, music events, uh, collaborated, you know, gaming events, uh, online gaming, and also digital uh, masterpieces there. Um, uh, so actually these are also, you know, a collaboration with local uh, cultural uh, uh, content uh, uh, pr producers uh, to better promote the luxury brands. And um, 
WeChat many many program also did a very good job for brand exhibit interactions, etc. So this actually uh, incredibly increased the mind share grabbing in the, among China's younger generation. Yeah. So next slide, please. Apart from the engagement, the expanding footprint in China also helps with the acceleration of the of the local market penetration. You know, brands are renovating and expanding flagship stores in premium locations during pandemic, like the Hermes in Peninsula, Beijing. Also, the you know the luxury saloons in Plaza Sixty Six. Right, these are newly built things. Right, and also luxury brands are exploring the opportunities in more lower tier cities uh, by connecting with the new projects with the experienced uh, commercial property landlords. Uh, like SKP, uh, like the the the, the CRMX, uh, etc. Right, and uh, uh, with this new projects established in you know lower tier cities like Kunming, uh, Plaza sixty six, and also like Chengdu SKP, etc. There are selective new openings which can increase the lower tier cities penetration, and Hainan of course will also uh, help with the repatriation. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. And Chris, maybe um, yeah. for some of our investors who are less familiar mm -hmm. with Hainan mm -hmm. Island, can you maybe just talk a little bit about uh, what Hainan Island is? Why is it so popular? Yeah, sure. So Hainan is definitely a very special island and a very special, you know, retail environment mm -hmm. in China because it offers offshore duty-free uh, purchase uh, to, you know, Ch mm -hmm. Chinese nationals. Uh, i.e. for each Chinese national, you have around RMB 100K per year uh, per uh, purchase, you know, budget in Hainan so that you can enjoy the duty-free purchase in Hainan. Uh, and uh, currently, you know, the, uh, the listed price in Hainan versus, you know, duty paid uh, scenario is something around 10% to 15% off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that actually helps stimulate uh, the, the spending repatriation. Right now, uh, Hainan Offshore Duty Free offers prestige beauty, uh, offers, you know, uh, luxury goods. As you may know, uh, Louis Vuitton and Christian Dior just opened in Hainan in the end of the year 2023. Oh, wow. So, yeah, mark another milestone by introducing top luxury brands into mm -hmm. Hainan. Yeah. It's kind of like, I call it like the, the Hawaii mm -hmm. of China. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's in southern China, very uh, yeah. tropical, beautiful beaches, a lot of golf courses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Hainan, especially Sanya, is one of the, you know, most popular uh, vacation destinations for Chinese people, especially during winter. Yeah. 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 If you're up in Harbin, you got to get out of the cold. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Harbin is <laughs> another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, maybe the next slide, please. Go back to our repatriation story. Then the yeah uh the the slides before please yeah the repatriation is also helped by the narrowing price gap. Uh, as we said, as you can see, uh, the Chinese mainland, uh, you know, uh, price uh, versus, you know, uh, uh, France uh, for soft luxury has been continuously declining over the, over the years. Of course, foreign exchange might be a reason, but actually you can, you can see uh, the price gap has been gradually coming to a narrower uh, scenario. And uh, for the price gap with France by region, it was even seeing actually a reverse trend, like, uh, if we compare, you know, uh, price apple to apple with, you know, post VAT, VAT price, uh, this will show, you know, a reverse trend. China mainland may even see listed price cheaper, right? This is exclude, you know, tax return uh, impact, tax refund impact. Yeah. So right now it will be even, you know, more convenient for and also better for money for 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 Chinese consumer to purchase in 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 uh in China local market. So next slide, please. Something about 2024 uh, quickly goes through uh, the uh, the outlook. We expect the entire global personal luxury goods sector to deliver 5% worldwide growth in the year and reaching somewhere around 381 billion euro and Chinese clientele will continue to be the main growth driver. Uh, we actually forecast a mid teens Kager uh, in our September initiation. And this, this is because of a bid in 2023 uh, still remain valid uh, right now and we expect 15% Kager. And with 2025 largely back to the pre-COVID level at around 95 billion euro of Chinese clientele spending. 
So uh, for the Chinese cohort spending in the year of 2024, we expect a 10% worldwide growth, reach around 88 billion, and driven by firstly continued outbound control recovery mentioned before, and also a stable onshore market growth. We expect the onshore growth to be somewhere around low to mid single digit, supported by you know the pri price increase, which is somewhere low to mid single digit, and slight new opening impact, and help with the mixed impact because uh, the growth is more supported by VIP, by high net worth, but than mass uh, uh, middle class, um, volume might be sl uh, still slightly muted or even slightly decreasing. So mix and the price is still most important drivers. And um, right now for the spending repatriation we mentioned before, uh, two thirds will be in home market. Next slide, please. So other key engines and trends we think worth highlighting 2024 Firstly, uh, the high net worth uh, still be the most important support. This is not only about Chinese, this is also a global trend, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, also the mixed improvement is also the global trend to be the most important supporter to the growth. And the uh, next, uh, we highlight a fewer price increase in the year of 2024 versus uh, past three years. In the year of 2020 to 2023, actually the average price increase CAGR I mean, each year will be reach around 10% worldwide increase. So making three years uh, stack uh, price uh, increase reaching somewhere around 30%, right? So in the year of 2024, we expect some, you know, slowdown with average industry growth in close to mid single digits. Prada, Montclair, uh, seeing somewhere around mid single digits, Louis Vuitton, low to mid single digits, and Hermes may be the uh, strongest one, seeing 8%, uh, you know, price increase expected. And the third trend we would like to highlight is a focus into building and scaling its beauty business of luxury brands. Uh, this is a very interesting trend because actually uh, we believe uh, these you know, uh, luxury companies would like to leverage its beauty business to continue attracting aspirational customers' awareness uh, amid consumption downgrading. We know that mass consumer is not a big supporter when macro environment becomes complicated, but still we need to nourish uh, this you know, customer group and we still need to do the customer recruitment. And um, uh, beauty business becomes a very good uh, you know, uh, segment. We know that Louis Vuitton has been doing uh, several times of you know, price increase of its entry level leather goods. So the price points may not be very, you know, quite attractive to you know, uh, some of the Chinese uh, uh, middle class anymore, right? So we need this part. And uh, in terms of Paris Olympics, we look forward to a substantial rise in tourist traffic due to the uh, uh, due to Olympics. However, we do not want to overestimate the conversion as well as the average ticket size. Firstly, uh, because you know the travel spending as well as accommodation spending would uh, would likely to see a huge rise uh, during the Olympic period. Here we also offer some data, like you can see the Olympic uh, premium of hotel rates can even reach somewhere around four times to five times, right? So this will actually consume a large bu bucket of your total travel budget. So maybe shopping budget might not be benefit too much on that in terms of tourists. Right. And in terms of VIP spending, because there are too many tourists, we actually uh, we actually uh, th hope that the brand would actually uh, would believe they will actually uh, try their best to provide, you know, uh, good and superior uh, purchasing experience. But still a huge traffic might still be a question uh, whether, you know, VIP could get their very, very, you know, uh, uh, unique service under under such huge traffic so we don't uh, suggest to extrapolate too much on paris olympics yeah mm. so lastly 4q result at a glance uh we see a 4q result show sequential re recovery and which actually drives a better than fear the thesis in the stock trading after you know uh luxury giants like richmond lvmh and the uh, Hermes post their results uh, and the driver sector rate. And we would like to highlight that performance across brands is still polarized. We see brands with the strongest momentum sell, uh, see sales growth holding up very well, um, while profitability is, is better than feared. And the larger brands with iconic product presence and quite luxury brands were generally better off. Uh, from another perspective, uh, fashionable or smaller brands are generally still suffering. 
So in terms of organic growth by region, APEC and Japan were still the key drivers, and the sequential improvement has been seen uh, for majority uh, of the brands in the Americas, while Europe performance still diverges. So next slide, and next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. And in terms of the profitability trends, because as we see that, you know, third quarter and fourth quarter still see, you know, relatively more normalized uh, sales growth versus the first half, uh, there would be some sort of, you know, the, the normalization of EBIT, uh, EBIT margin trends too, uh, due to a slightly lower sales growth. However, uh, majority of the most uh, uh, strongest uh, uh, luxury giants still uh, uh, still demonstrates a very outstanding, you know, uh, profitability protection, uh, uh, controlling, you know, discretionary costs and try their best to generate store productivity. So uh, that actually drives a better than feared, you know, profitability trend in the second half. Yeah. So right now the sector valuation has already been uh, back to the, you know, uh, 2023 peak level uh, as the last slide we, we show in the, in the, in the PPT. So next slide, please. And right now, uh, right now the, the market is rewarding uh, the, the, the entire sector. And uh, let's see if the, uh, if the first quarter of 2024 will still, you know, be slightly better than people expected because the first quarter of 2024 will likely be the 12th of the full year sales. And after this quarter, uh, we expect sales will be sequentially improving the coming quarters. So this concludes my, you know, uh, sharing in the uh, outlook of 2024 and it concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. No, thank yeah. you. Bruce. That was, uh, yeah, yeah, just so, so good. Yeah, such a thorough analysis and so many, uh, so many great points. I think, again, you know, a lot of these broader trends that mm -hmm. you spoke to was really the rationale, the thesis for uh, us launching um, KLXY, our global right. luxury ETF. And, right. um, you know, definitely for those joining us, please email any questions to info at craneshares.com. Or if you're joining us on the Zoom, uh, please use your Q&A button. Um, but I think I had a few questions myself. You know, I think one of the, one of the things that really jumps out uh, to me was this repatriation idea mm -hmm. that uh that you know we you know as students or of china's economy uh we're starting to see you know trip.com had great great results showing right. that domestic and international travels picking up mm -hmm. uh from yum china it shows that people are willing to go eat um eat more uh you obviously will get meadowan's numbers right. uh, um in a few weeks, but, you know, a little bit of, you know, from what I experienced having been in, in Europe last month, I was in Milan mm -hmm. and, um, it was funny to see a lot of the luxury goods stores in Milan catering to Chinese visitors that the, uh, Richemont's, um, watch store had, was all decked out in dragons. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm -hmm. but you're this idea that, that, that you see more consumption taking place in mm -hmm. China versus what we've seen historically, which is part mm -hmm. of this overseas travel. Is that driven by the luxury brands kind of going deeper in tier one, tier two cities? Or do you kind of envision some of the, the local, uh, more domestic travel versus overseas? Yeah. So this is a very good question. Uh, actually, yeah, this question can be divided into two parts. Uh, firstly, uh, we, we do reckon that maybe in the next one to two years, the Chinese clientele's recovery may be mainly driven by the comeback of the outbound spending. Mm -hmm. However, we think in the midterm, the outbound spending will no longer go back to where it was pre-COVID. So which indicates, you know, a structural repatriation still in the mid uh, midterm. And actually the reason behind is, as I said before, the, uh, the, actually the, supply side, the luxury brands uh, actually put a 
much more resources into the localized efforts mm -hmm. into China market. And um, pre-COVID, actually, you know, all of these luxury brands already have such kind of plan to gradually enhance, you know, the, the local market penetration mm -hmm. because it will be the most efficient way to, you know, uh, penetrate uh, 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 consumers in their local market getting closer to them, right? And the COVID just actually accelerate this, you know, uh, this program, mm -hmm. right? As we said, uh, they uh, they are going to do more and more local CRM. Uh, for example, maybe uh, pre-COVID, a lot of, you know, VIPs, which is used to spend overseas, uh, they live overseas, work overseas or study overseas. They don't have too much, you know, contact points in China. They don't know which SA to go to. Right. And uh, during COVID, when they're actually staying in China, uh, they start to purchase in, in local market. They start to build up, you know, the SA connections. Uh, and because they speak the same language mm -hmm. and sharing the same content, understanding on the brand, actually the communication is large likely to be smooth. Right. And that's why the, the purchase uh, history as well as the connection has been established so that the CRM is e easily to be, you know, maintained in, in China local market. That is actually a structural thing mm. and that is actually which we believe would would um contain a large portion of the spending in you know mainland china we we know that previously uh before pre-covid a large portion of you know uh spending as contributed by you know daigo as well as you know middle class tourists who are you know price sensitive right and right now, because the entire luxury market is more supported by VIP clients, high net worth mm -hmm. clients, uh, Daigo's uh, should be vanished quite a lot. Middle class should see lower conversion. And for this strong spending VIP customers, they have a much better connected, uh, you know, uh, luxury SAs, luxury connections mm -hmm. in China. And their price difference, indifference, right? Yeah. So. Uh, I believe a large, uh, a considerable portion of spending will contend in local market. Yeah, yeah it's interesting you, that that price insensitive that mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned uh, the average spending about three hundred thousand RMB, so you know, call it forty thousand dollars US. Mm -hmm. I mean, this. Uh, just a lot of money to be spending on handbags and luxury goods. It's <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, one one question from our friend Evelyn uh, asked. Um, you know, what's kind of your is is Starbucks kind of considered a luxury brand in China? Just uh, is that, you know, you know a, is it, you know, historically we've seen Starbucks as a brand, mm -hmm. like a, almost a quasi luxury brand that you're showing people you can afford to carry this high overpriced coffee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen competitors, I think Luckin. Uh, last year actually sold right. more coffee, but just kind of curious if you have, uh, based on our friend Evelyn's question, any views of Starbucks? How has that brand maybe changed over the years? Okay. So um, maybe firstly, uh, we don't cover Starbucks, we mm -hmm. don't cover Luckin. So maybe we cannot comment too specifically into the competitive landscape mm -hmm. of the China coffee market, but maybe as a as a trend, we uh we would like to share some you know high level industry view on that. We we do see like uh including you know the coffee uh coffee category as well as the tea category right uh becoming maybe more or less a new you know uh lipstick in effect in China right. Mm -hmm. uh, people are willing to spend in in experimental. Uh, things and also likes to spend in life local lifestyle mm -hmm. things right now uh, post pandemic right and these names like for example uh, like Luckin Coffee, Coffee Coffee they offer coffee mm -hmm. drinks in a very you know value for money price segmentation and also the tea category also so that's why yeah. we do see the reason of such kind of you know experiential spending getting a momentum yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the bubble tea has uh, <laughs> yeah. become you know very popular, and yeah. then uh, I think even Tim Hortons, the uh, Canadian right. donut coffee shop, right. has going into China, right. and uh, yeah, when I was in Hong Kong, uh, I was so embarrassed to go get a coffee at Starbucks, but it was right, <laughs> you know, right there. Um, yeah. The Starbucks uh, maybe have different, you know, a uh, brand positioning versus uh, uh, local co uh, local coffee drinks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another question we're getting is, uh, 
you know, one of the issues that has weighed on China's economy as well as consumption trends mm -hmm. has been real estate prices. That yes. You, you actually uh, mentioned that the number of apartments owned by wealthy has mm -hmm. come down a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, there's a lot of policy support to real estate uh, to stabilize prices. Uh, but how has that affected this luxury good cohort, this segment of immune mm -hmm. spenders, or have they even been affected by uh, the some of the, uh, you know, again, the consumer confidence, I do believe, is coming back. You know, mm -hmm. economies go through cycles, and I yeah, think exactly. we are coming out of it. I think that's what's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but but had did you see any of those consumption trends from this unique element uh, come down because mm -hmm. of real estate? Okay. Uh, so I would like to say that, uh, you know, um, for the Chinese clientele spending, we said it was more good to a support of, you know, still strong VIP spending versus, uh, versus you know, aspirational customers. And I believe, you know, quite a few luxury giants like LMH also said a little bit about, about that. So the reason why we see a relatively lower support uh, from, from Chinese clientele uh, uh, aspirational customer segment is more or less connected with, with real estate. As a background, we know that China's luxury market has been booming in the past 15 years, mm -hmm. right, more than a decade. And this story is mainly a penetration rate increase story and especially supported by China's middle class, mm -hmm. right? Especially high tier city middle class, mm -hmm. right? Accompanied with, you know, a booming sector, emerging sector in TMT, uh, in, in consumer service, uh, in healthcare, etc. right? We see uh, a lot of um, new job opportunities offered with actually uh, quite good, you know, uh, quite good uh, salary offering, mm -hmm. right? Right now we're seeing several several challenges, right? Um, there are, you know, also several pay cuts or layoffs in China happening uh, in the in the past few years, right? And also we have the real estate problem, so that the income outlook has been a little bit, you know, impacted. Uh, for the for the uh, middle class, that's true, especially for the high tier cities, because they also put some leverage into like investing into real estates. So the leverage ratio is something that people do worry about, right? So uh, that's why actually right now uh, this is the this is the uh, thing that you know government also want to solve as soon as possible uh, to to actually enhance people's income outlook so that you know consumer sector can see a turnaround, right? Mm -hmm. Just need to wait and see when. And, uh, uh, real estate policy could actually work sometime. And um, yeah, consumer confidence has been seeing sequential recovery, marginal mm -hmm. recovery. That is, yeah, um, I hope this is encouraging and I hope it could last for, for yeah, for the, for the midterm. And uh, from the other perspective, we do still see some, you know, consumption up trading opportunity in China's lower tier cities. Right. Mm. For the throughout the year of 2022, 23 into 24, we are so, we are talking about you know consumption down trading, but still we see up trading opportunity still exists. Right. For lower tier cities of Chinese residents, we see you know actually le uh, uh, relatively lower leverage. Mm. Right. Uh, and also we see lower living cost. Although their income level is not the highest among China, mm -hmm. but actually uh, people feel their lives are uh, uh, less burdened by the strong leverage in real mm -hmm. estates. So that would actually help with, you know, uh, people's, you know, motivation uh, into certain, you know, upgrade products if they are well penetrated. So that might be one of the angle that people, uh, that China will still contribute to the penetration rate increase in the luxury goods industry in the midterm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people ask me this question: What will what will be the next driver uh, to drive the in the in, entire industry growth in the next ten years? Because we all know China is the biggest supporter in the past fifteen years, and beforehand it was Japan, right? Mm -hmm. So each period with a large, you know, standalone uh, economy entity supporting, right? So in the future, maybe we we'll still see you know the penetration rate story of luxury goods uh, ongoing. Right. Uh, right now we have, you know, 
uh, uh, Southeast Asia booming, right? The mm -hmm. US performing very good in terms of economy, right? And the middle class is also a very big supporter, right? Although cur currently there are some, you know, uh, geopolitical issues there, right? So there are a lot of, you know, uh, drivers going on and uh, China will still continue to support while the dynamic will be maybe firstly VIP continue willing to spend and also lower TSC's upgrades continue to support if the market will turn around as something going to happen in the next one to two years. So maybe some positive surprise even lying there. Yeah. Interesting. You know, it's interesting, you know, I thought two two other little data points that I thought were very interesting is one, you talk about uh, demographics. And, mm -hmm. you know, when people say China demographics, it's usually doom and gloom. But you, you actually talk about demographics as mm -hmm. this younger generation, their willingness to spend, but 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 then particularly women and and kind of curious, you know, just real uh, quick, because we've got a few questions uh, we want to be able to, right. uh, but just kind of curious, you know, what, what is, you know, that demographic, what's driving that demographic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trend? Mm -hmm. And then my other question that you had is you mentioned, uh, you know, I'm, I'm canceling my my trip to Paris for the Olympics, because you showed how, how they're raising the prices uh, for hotels during the Olympics, a 500% premium, amazing. Yeah, yeah. But but curious, you know, one of the other things we hear about China is, well, you can't trust the data. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, how do you, you mentioned like using WeChat mm -hmm. um, in your presentation, you mentioned going on uh, booking.com to mm -hmm. get some of these prices. How do you use a kind of data, you know, how are you getting data from non-traditional sources to help you come up with the price targets, your your models for these underlying companies. Okay, yeah. So firstly, for the demographic trend, actually, uh, this is a very commonly asked question in terms of the China consumer space, as well as you know the global luxury space, of course. Yeah, this is um uh, inevitably this is one a, a sort of you know a challenge to mm -hmm. to a very very long term you know, China's consumer growth story, right? Uh, people worrying at uh, maybe, you know, lower lower people uh, spending, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, lower amount of people spending, right? But right now in the next, you know, two, uh, two to three decades, we would like to highlight some trends. Firstly, uh, you know, uh, the, the current, you know, China's younger generation is still in a very, very large base, right? Uh, compared with other economy entities. And uh, secondly, uh, we can see that uh, right now the uh, the gray hair economy is more and more brought up, right? I.e., a lot of you know parents currently is still able to uh, able to support their children, especially when the macro is actually not very supporting mm. to job, right? To job securities uh, or to the salaries, you know, um, upside, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for this, you know, for uh, for for this, you know, parent level who was born in maybe in the nineteen sixties or nineteen seventies, they are still relatively uh, better off. They are born in the China booming uh, economy uh, stage. So actually, I think their support would also be a relatively, you know, uh, a protection. We don't say they they're going to support their child to purchase luxury goods, but I would I would say this would be a protection in terms of the you know the wealth effect or income outcome yeah. of their younger generation. And I guess the yeah. that from J Japanese, which yeah. went, uh, I think they were peak population back in 2013. Right. Um, and yet they're such a strong contributor to luxury goods sales, despite, you know, a, uh, a very slow mm -hmm. population decline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also from our, our you know, uh, tracking on data, we do see the searching interest on Baidu is actually gradually shifting back to uh, some, you know, younger, younger clientele. Mm -hmm. Yeah, previously we can say the age group of 20 to 29 age uh, group has actually seen the proportion increasing uh, 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 constantly. And uh, starting from 2022, you can see the age group of 30 to 39 or 40 to 49 uh, percentile is actually low. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So the second question is regarding the how to how to get data from non-traditional mm -hmm. pathways to support my maybe my forecasts or my uh my views to the industry, right? Of course, we as we said, uh VIP or we say high net worth clients uh maybe have very different spending uh spending patterns uh with you know aspirational customers stuff. Right? So definitely both parts we need to uh we need to you know uh take a look into, right? 
for VIP trends, of course, their asset allocations strategies, as well as well as you know, uh, some uh, anal analysis from from private banking who is closest to high net worth should be some of the points that are worth looking okay. into, right? Uh, they will know how their client is, how their you know spending pattern is, how their investment is, uh, right? So this they are very good insight into that. You know, usually you know private banking will also publish some you know uh, reports which is public information that came for our rest. Uh, reference. Of course, Citix SS also have uh, Citix also have its own private banking. So yeah, that's that's the first uh, you know uh, part about you know VIP, mm -hmm. right? And uh, secondly, uh, about you know the 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 mass uh, consumers, aspirational consumers. Of course, searching interest, Google Trends, um, Baidu Trends. Uh, these are more representative to you know entry level or is aspirational customers, mm -hmm. right? VIP customers don't really need to search. Uh, their yeah. SA already pushed the, all the information. <laughs> to them right uh, and secondly uh regarding you know the uh the macro data this is also a very good read into you know how the uh, uh, consumer confidence is right and for each um for each regional market they have you know uh different uh variables that are matters mm -hmm. most to their income outlook right for example for china uh maybe real estate accounts more right so uh so uh, this will be you mm -hmm. know different read across uh apart different uh, regions Right. And uh, finally, maybe like uh, a lot of different uh, regional markets will offer credit card data. Uh, this is uh, some buy side will yeah. actually wait through. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I thought it's, um, you know, one of the things that doesn't get a lot of attention, but, uh, you know, credit card companies, ATM, debit, you know, there's they're selling that transaction data to people. Um, you know, hedge funds might want to day trade on some of those, uh, but you're, you're able to get this really, really strong data on consumption trends from the credit card companies themselves who are monetizing it. And uh, it's, I'm sure it's an important input for yourself or yeah, one is, of the inputs. Yeah, yeah this is uh, referring, you know, by side investors, something that they will follow. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, one of uh, after I visited with you in Hong Kong, I I took the high speed train mm -hmm. from Hong Kong up to Shenzhen. Yeah, it's very convenient, um, right? Super. Well, I got off at the wrong station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I had an interesting little experience there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, when I got back down to my hotel, I was walking around and right, you know, I've said, you know, I admit, you know, I was probably staying in a wealthier part of Shenzhen. Right. But I was shocked that, uh, just going from the trains, the wrong train station to my hotel, I saw two Maybox, mm -hmm. two, you know, very super high end um, Mercedes right near my hotel was a Rolls Royce dealer. Wow. And then I was able to visit with BYD mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't, they didn't let me drive it, but I got to sit in their new luxury SUV. Uh, I, I think today they just released their supercar. Um, it's an amazing vehicle. Um, but do you see, you know, I think in the U S and Europe, you know, people have these trophy cars mm -hmm. collections. Is that a trend that is taking place in China at all mm -hmm. uh, in terms of this, having these luxury cars or luxury car collections? Yeah. Uh, so firstly, I would like to say for the for the luxury car collections, these are more or less, you know, an activity for VIP customers, right? High yeah, network sure. spending customers. So this would be a relatively niche, you know, uh, collecting behavior, right? But uh, you know, I would like to say that in uh, in China, actually, the luxury the preference on luxury cars is actually very very explicit. Yeah, uh, if you refer to refer to bank data, you can definitely see uh, actually a strong preference of Chinese people to luxury cars, right? So this is the the one thing. And uh, for the uh, for the EV trend, of course, this was actually also an, another inevitable trend that was seen the structural uh, in uh, uh, structural market share again in uh, China's mass consumer, right? Uh, because uh, uh, because actually you know uh, right now the price points are becoming uh, much much more easier. Right. And also the supply is very good and the and the all of the, you know, system are evolving quite good. Right. So um, I would like to say, um, you know, for for the for the uh, for the EV trend, I don't think they really correlate with, you know, 
uh, that much with the luxury cars okay. uh, yeah, collection. Uh, but well, I do look forward to some, you know, breakthrough, like uh, do we have, you know, luxury EV cars uh, doing extremely well? Yes, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think the... You know, certainly there's a lot of emphasis on EV, but I, I thought it was interesting with meeting with BYD was their, mm -hmm. their emphasis on hybrid, that uh, yeah. they've invested a lot technologically in, in hybrid. And right. uh, I think it's uh, a great kind of stepping stone, uh, particularly in a big country like the U.S. or mm -hmm. even you know, if you're in a city, sure, you know, e pure EV is fine. But, yeah. uh, um, you know, one, one question I was came up uh, from one of one of the audience members around the Middle East and mm -hmm. it made me think about um you know do you see a similar kind of repatriation effect taking place in the Middle East there was did some of those consumption trends historically happen in Europe or kind of migrating back but um you know certainly a huge wealth and wealth effect in the Middle East and mm -hmm. how does um it's it's funny you, you know you you know, historically, people kind of break out, you know, Europe, the Americas, APAC, Japan. Yeah. But is the middle, you know, what's kind of your thoughts on Middle East and the wealth effect, the the habits of of some of the wealthy uh, luxury goods spenders there? Um, okay, so actually, I I think that Middle East has been a very strong supporter during you know COVID, right? And also uh, after the global reopening, they actually contributes a lot to the Europe market recovery. Yeah, right now we did see you know certain certain region in Middle East maybe like uh, uh having some you know uh yeah geopolitical issues mm -hmm. that need to be deal with, but still uh the the spending power of the the entire you know region is still very strong, right? Uh, with uh, with the support uh from the wealth effect supported by uh rich resources etc. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. So um, I'm still, you know, generally very positive in terms of the long trends of this of this region. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I would think. Uh, I mean, there's with just oil prices where they are. It's got to be uh, <laughs> a huge driver consumption trends. Right. And uh, yeah, I know we're we're at the hour, Chris, and uh, we want to make sure you stay on schedule. We know that uh, you have a very, very busy schedule getting in front of your clients while you're here in New York. And right. uh, just on behalf of Crane Shares, I just want to thank everyone uh, on behalf of our audience for you spending an, an hour with us. We're so appreciative uh, of your insights and we look forward to hosting you again the next time you're back here in New York. And uh, certainly for those, uh, if you wake up Tomorrow, and you have another question, please email us at info at craneshares.com. Or if you'd like further information on, on uh, KLXY or our luxury good ETF or any of our other exchange trade funds, please don't ever hesitate to reach out. And again, uh, a warm thanks, Chris. We're really, it's great to see you and certainly uh, appreciate you coming by and uh, sharing your insights with us. Yeah, it's with our us. pleasure. And thanks for having me again, Brandon. Thanks, Crane Share. 100%. Thank you. Thank you.